All right. Let's test, test, test. One, two, three. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> it's cool to have some people in the actual room, so we can do that. Uh, we also have some people joining from YouTube Live. Let me know in the chat if you're able to hear things okay, and then we'll get going because... Um, as Anne said yesterday, it wouldn't be a Theory Underground event without technical difficulties. Um, we've more or less gotten a lot of these technical difficulties ironed out, really, over the last several events. The issue yesterday was we found a new solution, but that new solution came with a new problem, uh, that being that Nance's computer overheated. So hopefully the way it's set up today, that doesn't happen. All right, Dilbert Hernandez says it sounds great. Well then, wonderful. Welcome everybody. Today we're coming at you all live from Seattle, Washington. This is the last live streamed uh, event of the Theory Underground tour. And so for those who didn't know, the tour has been going on since September 2nd. It's something that we started planning or that I started planning um, like four months ago. What's wrong? What's wrong? Oh, is it just what's on the screen? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You can just yell at me. Is it? Hey, put Zoom on there. Yeah, it's all right. No, it's fine. Derailing is fine. So this tour has been going on since September 2nd. It is a tour for the two books that we're not allowed to advertise, that we're not allowed to sell. I'll go ahead and just not even tell you about the books. Who cares about the books? Um, so this space is, is really special. This is the Columbia Library in Seattle. I don't know a whole lot about this district or this area or like what they're all about, but I suspect that the problems with this library are not unique to this library. Um, there's just a lot of bureaucratic red tape with events. Um, a problem that we have had as nomadic people being pretty much unbounded to an actual rental agreement or place for the last year is that we are locked out of all libraries, uh, more or less, right? Like sometimes you can get into the Wi-Fi, sometimes you can create a guest account, um, but for all practical purposes, libraries are usually focused on like the local area. And so it's uh, by the good graces of Thomas here that we were able to secure a space. So thank you, Thomas. You all get to meet Thomas here afterwards, uh, after the three talks, because uh, Thomas and Carl, and for people who are watching last night, Carl was actually a part of the audience in Portland. He's here with us today in Seattle. Um, they will both be guests on the panel. The theme of today is theory and practice. And there's a really easy way out of this whole conversation by saying the two are interreliant. The two inform one another. They are dialectical in a sense. And then we don't really have to think about it more, just move on, right? But we are of the persuasion that theory matters more than practice. And maybe I'm just bending the bow. You know, this is the metaphor that Aristotle develops. You know, if, if you have a bow that is bent a certain way, then the way to bend it straight is not just to put a book on top of it, but you actually bend it the opposite direction, right? Um, and Lenin uses the same metaphor, apparently. So bending the bow, why, why do we need to bend the bow? Well, it's because everywhere we've gone, people who like theory are primarily interested in using it for their practical projects. And my experience with burning out politically, being super engaged in 2016 for Bernie, being super engaged in 2020 for Bernie, also being involved in Marxist organizations, also being a part of the Democratic Socialists of America. I helped found the, the Boise chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. Being really engaged getting a sense for what was really going on, at least what I thought was really going on, and then kind of burning out on that. Um, I didn't have a place to go to try to understand what was going wrong, right? And something I say at the beginning of one of the books that we're not allowed to tell you about or sell you here, um, it's underground theory. It's called underground theory, coming to a city near you. Well, uh, in, in my piece, Lefter Than Thou Enjoyment, I started off by saying that there's basically two kinds of theory that stem from Marx, right? Um, it's 
what must be done. Like we know what must be done and here's what must be done versus, oh, that's not working. Why is that not working? Right. Uh, and the tendency today, and I would say across every educational space that actually engages with critical theory is to use it for uh, practical politics, right? And I, I, there's probably someone teaching Adorno somewhere who's who's just into Adorno and doesn't think about these things. There's probably someone teaching Derrida somewhere who doesn't, you know what I mean? Like the, the, in academic departments, isolated little academic departments, I imagine that there are professors who teach this theorist or that theorist, like Foucault or whatever. And they do kind of have this idea in mind that yes, this person is not just telling us how to do things or what must be done, but is actually saying Marxism didn't work. And this is why it was running up against these things. Um, and then you'll get, uh, but that's not the tendency, right? That, that That's not the tendency. The tendency is that if Derrida or Foucault or Baudrillard or Adorno or any of these other kinds of theorists uh, is being taught, it's being taught as a part of the professor or the instructor's uh, own political agenda. And anti-Marxism might actually be a part of their actual political agenda. Um, but for people who were inspired by critical theory as a Marxist project that is trying to understand the world so as to change the world, uh, we're in a serious problem when there's this division between the politics uh, or the theory of political, what must be done, and the uh, that's not working, what are we supposed to do about it? Because what Marx did in his time was he read through all of the most important bourgeois theorists and said, all right, so how can we take the baby not and, and throw out the bathwater, but not the baby, keep, keep the baby from each of these different projects and sublate those into something to help direct an already actually existing movement. And today, the already actually existing movement is arguably not even there. Arguably not even there. Um, insofar as there are momentary bursts of something, it's usually people who are ultimately uh, doing what we call the liberal rumspringa, right? Um, the rumspringa is the Amish, you know, at the age of 16, you can go off and party and, and, and do whatever you want, fornicate, and then eventually you can return um, or you can choose to go out of the fold and, and live on your own in the city. But the point is, is that our society, so liberal, would not tolerate people like the Amish if it wasn't for something like the Rumspringa, because they're essentially saying you, you're allowed to leave. And if it wasn't for that, we would consider it a cult. We would come in there and we'd say, we'd have to break it up. And so we're all a lot more tolerant of the Amish than we are a lot of other uh, variants of conservative, fundamentalist, uh, uh, traditionalist um tendencies because they have that um that sort of liberal idea of like let the kids decide if they want to go on with our worldview right whereas most conservatives most traditionalists they want a theocracy they want to tell you how it's going to be and then tell you you actually can't leave right that's terrifying we don't like that right but a liberal rumspringa is this time that you get into radical politics, uh, usually in college. Um, and this is something that you're supposed to do. You ask for the uh, impossible, you demand it, you hold the feet of the uh, the, 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 the feet of the elected representatives to the fire, you know, the bureaucrats in your institution, whatever, hold their feet to the fire, try to push them left, make them accountable. Um, and then eventually you get a job and move on. And then someday you'll say, I did that too. When I was younger, I remember being a radical. Those were good times. Yeah. Cause you were having fun because the whole thing is quite enjoyable. I mean, it's stressful, but there's a kind of enjoyment in that as well. Right. Well, um, we think that there needs to be a space for theory itself. Should that theory be ultimately directed towards say the liberation of all humankind from every kind of oppression? Probably, but also what's the scientific thing to do, right? The scientific thing to do is when experiments keep failing, right? You're not getting the expected results. 
you go back to the drawing board and you try to figure out what's going wrong. You don't keep trying to change things uh, or keep doing the experiments. You, you actually have to enter a period of moratorium where you critically suspend your presuppositions, right? The thing is, is when we're talking about social theory and real movements, we can't get that step back just by stepping back. We step back, all we're going to do is binge Netflix, um, jack off and eat ice cream, right? Like that's, it's not going to be useful. And so the idea of, of a non-instrumentalized kind of theory just focused on understanding things with maybe an eye towards going back to trying to change things again is something that is difficult. There's a contradiction there because uh, on the one side, you want to get back to making things cha change, but also, no, we, we actually have to give the devil its due. And as Hegel says, tarry with the negative, right? Tarry with the contradictions and work through them. And so that is what theory underground is trying to do. And that is this idea of, of drawing from all of the most important teachers and thinkers um, who have shown us fundamental contradictions with these older visions of what an emancipated society would look like and all of these older diagnoses with what the current problem actually is. Doing as Marx did would mean reading people who are doing that after he died, people who are not a part of the Marxist movement, right? This is why we read Martin Heidegger. Being in time is one of the most powerful critiques of modernity itself, right? It, and it's a kind of deconstruction of our presuppositions that we need if all we've really been into is, say, Marxist theory. Now, I also feel weird doing this because I'm always kind of going back to like this Marxist big other in my head. Like I'm having conversations with Marxists and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm leaving everyone else out. So a lot of people are like, well, I'm, I'm into socialism and Marx had some basically good ideas, but I don't really buy that all. Um, and there's a lot of that stuff that I'm very skeptical of. Like I, I disagree with the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. I disagree with the labor theory of value. I disagree with the dictatorship of the proletariat. I disagree with, oh, we actually have to seize the means of production, but I do like X, Y, and Z ideas, or I take the basic idea of class struggle. And then I put that onto other social groups, or there's all these various ways that we play in the, uh, the playground, uh, with, with the tools that belong in his workhouse or his uh, workhouse, his, uh, what's the word? Wheelhouse. Wheelhouse, yeah, thank you. Or work shed, I, work shed, yeah. Whatever it is. Um, so that's that's my preamble, that's my thoughts. That's, the, that's kind of what we're thinking through is that there needs to be a space for politically disaffected, burnt out, autodidacts, blue collar intellectuals, people who are working with earbuds in, who are training themselves intellectually, who are trying to step up their game um, to, and to try to understand things first, because people like that are generally skeptical and they're not going to trust somebody who's on uh, a political agenda to change the world in a specific way. Because if you already think you have the solution figured out, then uh, everything else you're teaching is towards that end. Right. And of course, if you're trying to be all scientific and go into things and try to get this bigger picture before you make your own decisions and the people who are teaching all, well, they already know what needs to happen, then it's not, it's not, it's, it, it's not conducive to an educational environment. Right. And so there are, uh, there are places like the new center for research and practice, um, GCAS, um, the European graduate school and, uh, the school for materialist research. And all of them are fantastic. Uh, we're going to be doing stuff with J.M. Adams later today. He is somewhere with the New Center for Research and Practice. But they are coming at things from and for explicitly leftist um, goals or ends. And they are mostly in dialogue with Marxists and deluso Guattarians. And the School for Socialist Research or uh, material, Materialist Research, it's Marxist, right? And it's materialist, right? You're not going to read Heidegger there, right? You're going to read Burnham there. Um, you're not going to read a lot of these thinkers that we engage with very seriously, like Carl Jaspers isn't even on their radar. But the first course at Theory Underground was the idea of the university. Not just like, we don't just critique the actually existing institution. We also think, but what is the idea? What is the ideal there? 
And the idea, in short, is a plurality of truth seekers coming together from their different experiences and backgrounds, trying to understand the whole by bringing their own specialized areas into conversation with one another, which is obviously not what we have today, right? Um, here, let me give you a co-host there, Nance. And uh, so the way it's going to go is Anne's going to give a talk. What are we doing? Nance is going to give his hot take on theory over practice. And then I'm going to read out something. And I've not been reading on this tour. I really haven't. It's not since Breckenridge, Colorado. But the thing I'm going to be reading out is something that I sat on for better part of eight months, I think. Um, Nance read it aloud this morning on our drive here. And it it checks out with where I still stand. It's rare that I write something and then still agree with it eight months later. So at this point, I need to be, I need to put it out there so you all, you all can start arguing with me, right? So that I can change more because we don't want to ever just get stuck in one spot. So that that's the way it'll go. And then if we have time, um, we'll see. We'll see if we have time for a presentation uh, from Carl. But if we don't, then I want you to be able to at least speak to the presentation that you will be able to give later um, in, a, say, a live stream or something we do off the record that we publish later or make available to people. There's all kinds of ways that we might go about that. But the thing that we're very excited about is after the three of us do this thing uh, that will get us called the post-leftist education entity on the internet when that's not even true, um, we'll actually bring on an anarchist and a socialist. Right. So it's like we're not post leftist. We're not leftist. We're not socialist. We're disaffected. We're burnt out. We're tired and we're trying to understand things. And the fact that we have an anarchist and a socialist who respect us and have honored us with their time and actually want to hear us out and engage with us on the panel discussion is really exciting to me. So, with that said, I'll just say a couple of things about Anne um, beyond the fact that she is my spouse as of like uh, two months ago. Uh, she is someone who graduated from Boise State University a couple of years ago with a bachelor's in social sciences. She's about to go back for a master's degree that she's putting together that is basically education and social science meets political philosophy. And the, 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 the stuff that she's been doing during this gap year that was more like two years um, is like we've traveled the world. We've been all over Europe. We lived in Mexico for five months to save money so that we could start Theory Underground. Um, and she has co-instructed two courses at Theory Underground. She helped teach the idea of the university course. And she is currently a co-instructor for Critical Media Theory. Uh, the research cohort going on at Theory Underground. It's one of the most exciting things we've ever done, and we're all really ecstatic about it. We actually have um, lectures for that coming up very soon. If you're interested in that stuff, do check out our existing courses. But her piece in the Underground Theory volume that I'm not allowed to tell you about or sell you, um, actually, it's called The Idea of the Neoliberal University. And this is related to her research, to her experiences as a student her experiences as a researcher and her experience as an instructor. She had all three of those experiences within a very short period of time. That's a very unique thing. And so please put your hands together to hear from her. Please welcome Anne Selgrove McCarriker. I was once a teenage Democrat, <laughs> um, but it's true. It is, it is true. I came to political consciousness like pretty early um i was home sick the day that the sandy hook shooting occurred and so i was asleep on the couch with just the tv on and i woke up to see these news stories and this was the first i was about 13 at the time this was the first like school shooting that i had ever known about um i was like absolutely mortified and distraught i thought how could this happen in the united states of america and and that i think really started my political consciousness i grew up with like very wonderful kind-hearted like very liberal democrat parents um and since kind of my becoming politically conscious until today i have dabbled in so many different activist 
in leftist spaces, hoping for something real, hoping for something meaningful, and hoping for something rigorous that was actually going to make changes into the everyday world, like actually stop school shootings from happening, actually make the living wage go up, actually get people health care. Um, and none of that has actually happened. Um, last night on the panel, Doug and Nance and Dave were all talking and Doug said, oh, yeah, like, what do you think about all this? And I, I honestly, when I, when I said it, I meant it, which is, I don't know what I think about all of this. I'm still young. I'm about to turn 24 in a few weeks. So I'm kind of at that stage in life where you're still supposed to be figuring things out. And I don't think I'm supposed to have all the answers, but I have found myself in so many different spaces that have claimed to know the answers. Real quick, is it possible to get the speaker view off that back there? That is, thank you. Cause it's like slightly lagging. It's very distracting. <laughs> cool. Um, but yeah, uh, I found myself in all these spaces that claimed to have the answers and none of them seemed to. And so I just find myself right now, like kind of nihilistic about everything, which I'll touch on later. But so I just want to kind of highlight like some of these various experiments that I've done, some of these various spaces that I've been in. Um, and it's really started in high school for me. I was kind of like the campus activist. I cringe at that fact. Like, I don't even know what I was saying or doing. I hope I wasn't offending people too much or like calling people terrible things. Um, but I was specifically like very anti-gun uh, activist. I organized uh, two walkouts, you know, with school shootings continuing to happen um, and was the student that all my teachers thought, oh, she's going to go to law school and change the world. Um and at that time in high school, I always knew, I'm just like, capitalism's bad. I don't know why, but I just know that it is. Um, and that's when I, you know, graduated. I, I went to college at Boise State, and I decided to be a political science major. I said, I'm not going to be one of those students that changes their major. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn political science and become a legislator and change the world. And after a semester, I went, okay, no, that's that's not going to happen in this major. Um, in political science, you're learning a lot more about how the systems work, not how to change the systems. And that's when I discovered, well, I read Marx with um, a club that David had on campus at the time. And I went, oh, this is where sociology comes in and what sociology is supposed to teach you. So I said, oh, I'll take sociology students and that's where I'll learn how to change the world and learn how to make the system better and abolish capitalism. And then that didn't really work. Um, my sociology education was great. And I had really great instructors and I'm, you know, I'm going back to get my master's degree there in the spring, but there was nothing rigorous about my time in the sociology department. I was never assigned any primary texts of Marx, Weber, Durkheim, like primary fundamental sociologists. Um, and really, it just kind of became not only in my sociology department, but in sociology departments all over the country. It just kind of became a place that like tries to pump out activists whose only answer to the ills of the world is it's just racist people. It's like, Maybe there's some truth to that, but there's nothing like rigorous or sociological about that prescription. And so I said, okay, sociology is not going to do it. Let's get involved with like the organizations on campus. Um, I showed up for about two semesters. I was, I was also on campus at the time, COVID. And so that really stifled some of my opportunities to like really be involved. But for a few semesters there, I was showing up to the Black Student Alliance meetings. They said, white people come to our meetings, unlearn your racism. And I said, yes, okay, I want to, like, I'm here for it. I want to make, you know, I want to, I want to make the world a better place. I want to listen. I want to learn. Um, and that space, like, no one acknowledged my existence. Like, literally, no one would talk to me. So I said, okay, maybe this is not the space for me. You know, I'm trying to engage, I'm trying to learn. No one will even, like, say hi to me. So I'll try something else. Um, and that is where, in it was early 2020, um, an organization was started on campus called the Red Republicans, which is now known as the Red Labor Caucus, part of the DSA. Um, and I really thought, okay, this is it. There's some like people here, of all different backgrounds, ethnicities, genders here to like do something different, to engage with Marxism and the working class and people 
of left, right, center, working class students, apolitical students. Like we were going to do it. We're going to do something different. Dave had just given a presentation on um, this concept of time energy, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point more in this. But we can't talk about the book that is for sale that you sh should not buy because we can't promote it. Um, but this concept of time energy, I think, was really resonating with me in that, you know, we're advocating for not just, oh, workers should own the means of production, but we shouldn't have to identify as workers. Our whole lives shouldn't revolve around work. Our lives should revolve around living, like being people, doing the things that we want to do, building the relationships that we want to build, learning languages, learning instruments, traveling, not just like, what is my job? I'm having to work so much during any given week. And so Dave gave this presentation about time energy and I thought, okay, great. This is going to be an organization that's actually trying to reach people on what I believe is a very unifying idea that we shouldn't have to be workers. We should we should have good lives for ourselves and be able to like be human beings. And unfortunately, this group just kind of ended up more or less turning into while well, I was there. I don't know what the organization is up to now. I think they're doing great things. All of these organizations, I think, have intrinsic value and are helping the people that are in the organizations. And I'll get to why they just didn't work for me. Um, but it kind of just ended up turning into, a, during my time there, a bunch of like LARPing history dude bros who thought it was the 1920s in Bolshevik Russia. And I said, no, we're in like 2020 America. There's there's neoliberalism. There's all these different things. Like capitalism has evolved so much since then. And that was not really taken seriously. It was, no, let's just read Stalin. We don't actually have to read anything because as working class people, we just know the theory deep in our souls. Like that's more or less what people were saying. Like we don't have to read because we know intrinsically. I said, okay, again, like maybe not the space for me. And it was really in my involvement with that organization and my involvement with the DSA, my involvement with canvassing for Bernie and putting like a lot of time and a lot of money into trying to get Bernie Sanders elected. I said, okay, th this is something real. This is something, you know, being involved in the DSA, I was uh, one of the officers of my local DSA. Um, and I think I, I just realized and this kind of goes back to like, I was a, a teenage Democrat. It was really that time when I would, when I said, okay, electoral politics, not going to do anything. Like the Democratic Party is not actually representing working people. You know, they'll, they'll put a little like LGBT progress flag on their blouse as they go up there and vote against raising the minimum wage. So fundamentally anti-working class, all of these organizations I was I got plugged into just never seemed like they were trying to do anything new, never seemed like they were trying to do anything rigorous. And so I've come to this point now after seeing everything go down with COVID, after seeing the way that the left is behaving today, like it's very easy for Fox News to make fun of these people. Like, I'm not going to pretend that oh, what they're doing is virtuous or good, like shaming people and erasing women and this, that, and the other thing. And so I found myself in this just very like nihilistic position right now where I said, fuck everything. I'm going to fucking vote for Harambe for president. Like, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and I don't mean that. I know that I am young and that there is time for me to find the organization out there for me. And I guess that's something I'm really looking forward to talking about on the panel from these two people who are more politically involved. But I just want to know, like, where are the organizations? Where are the people who are trying to really understand this particular moment in time and in capitalism and make some real change that that matters and that can get working class people's support? Um, I find the most meaning out of reading and engaging and looking for new solutions. And that's not going to be for everyone. And maybe I just didn't find the right the right space for that or the right DSA or the right college or university or whatnot. Um, and so I'm still hopeful that those people in those organizations exist. I'm not completely nihilistic or pessimistic. Like the reason I'm here, the reason I'm engaging is because I still have some hope. I think that is also something we said last night, or maybe we said it in the car ride home is 
we wouldn't be on the road writing and reading. I wouldn't be going to get a master's degree if I didn't have some sliver of hope. But I'm just in this weird, weird transitional phase of like, where do I put this energy? Right now I'm thinking, I'm not going to give it to any organization. I'm going to keep it for myself and my loved ones. And one day I'd like to be a teacher and I'll give that energy to my students and influence individual people because the organizations that I see existing right now are are too far gone. They're too far gone one way or the other. Um, and they're alienating real people. I also see in this particular moment um, being like a cisgendered white woman um, I feel weird in these spaces. I see people, this is like, I feel terrible saying this, but this is my truth. This is how I feel. I see people who look like they're activists. You, you can tell what they look like. And I get scared of them. I'm scared of them because there's like real physical violence happening against people who are critical or who speak out against these movements. So I go, okay, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to be safe. I'm going to keep my body safe. Um, I also see, you know, all the spaces that I was in there's not really room for like, like motherly nurturing, like feminine women. Um, and I go, where's the space for that too? Um, can we have a game night? Can we like sit down and, and just, and just chat for a little bit and, and talk about our lives and try to be friends also. And it's no, we're either doing history or shut the fuck up white lady. Like that's what I see. And so I'm doing my own thing, but I'm also like, I believe in the project of Theory Underground. I believe in all of these organizations that I think have disaffected people who are trying to do something new. And so I really am just looking forward to the panel and kind of bringing all of these disaffected voices together who've all seen various things that are working. And I want to know like, what is working? Where can I put my energy outside of Theory Underground? Because Dave and Nance will get into this like theory versus praxis. I love theory. I'm always going to keep reading theory and engaging with it and learning. But I do also want to make the world a better place. I've always wanted to. And so that's where I'm at. That Thank you for hearing me out. Um, that was just kind of setting setting the scene of my disenfranchisedness. But next we'll hear from someone else. <laughs> from Nance. So I'll introduce Nance. Um, we've been saying this whole time that Nance is just the random homeless man that we found on the side of the road at the beginning of the tour. And we picked him up um, and he's been here the whole time. That is not true. Nance has been one of, <laughs> he doesn't, he got a haircut, so he can't pull off that look anymore. Um, yeah. Um, Nance has been one of the most engaged patrons of Theory Underground in terms of time and energy. He's done a lot of reading, like, so he's done a lot of reading. No, he's put in the time and the energy to do the readings, to do the work, to write, to grow, to think, to engage. And he's super awesome. And he's got things to say that I think are important and worth hearing. So let's hear it for Nance. Thank you, Anne. I don't know if I do have much to say, or at least much to say that is worth hearing. Um, I think, from my perspective, the question of, of theory over organizing. Um, organizing has never really meant much to me. Um, I was kind of fallen into anarchism as a young person. I was uh, a crust punk, and uh, anarchism was kind of the ideology that was on offer. Um, I think... The first book I ever read that made me question politics, political action, society, all that was a biography of Rigoberta Minshew, who was a Guatemalan farmer. And it it was like her recounting of the coffee slaves in Guatemala. Um, and I was like, yeah, that sucks. Um, Starbucks is enslaving people. <laughs> Um, like actually enslaving people. Um, and then from there, um, I just got more and more interested in emancipation, um, but not having a home, not having a framework to to study and, and come together with other like-minded people and, and really do anything. Like we were just doing drugs, having sex, vandalizing and acting out 
in our in our hurt and in our lack and in our longing. Um, and yeah, there were some people that that did some things for sure. Like it wasn't all just bullshit, but for the most part, um, I like to say I like to use the metaphor of the island of misfit toys. Um, I and I feel like that's like we still are that. Um, but if, if we spend a little bit more time to be more deliberate, um, and, and we're more intentional with our action, we can become more than just a bunch of malcontents raging against, um, this seemingly all powerful system. Um, and so really from my perspective, always kind of being on the outside of, uh, everything theory and organizing, uh, it was just, it was like, oh, there's white people that go to college and join the DSA and then come to me at my job where I'm cleaning toilets or driving trucks um, or working at a printing press or, or doing all these jobs. Uh, and they come in and they, they tell us things. They say, you know, it, it's all about, it's all about bigotry in all its forms. And I do yeah, like that's true. And that's undeniable. Like that bigotry is kind of like inherent in, in all the systems that exist, but just addressing racism and homophobia and, and sexism and, and all these things on an interpersonal level doesn't really do anything at all, except give those white people that went to college prestige points. Uh, and it makes the workers feel like shit. Um, and it makes us develop these divisions of like, oh, I think we should be cool to one another. So I'm going to, I'm going to be a socialist. I'm going to be a leftist. I'm going to be a communist, a Marxist, an anarchist, whatever, all the words that from my perspective as someone who I didn't get to go to college, I didn't get to join organizations. I didn't get to do all these things. All these words just kind of blended together into leftist. Um, and so you have the rare leftist, and then you have the overwhelming majority of workers who are for the most part reactionary, because that's just the general tendency. We're always set in this scarcity mindset. We're always habituated into this protective mode of, of acting where someone else's, um, benefit always comes at the cost of someone else's you know risk or, or or whatever and it and it always does it truly always does come at the cost when we're all fighting over scraps um and so that was kind of always my my opinion of of organizing um and then of course there's demonstrations and, and counter demonstrations and direct action and propaganda of the deed and all these things and I think for the most part, I've had some fun engaging in that type of mass action. Um, but I've, I've never really had access to direct collective action, such as like community gardens um, and community fridges and, 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 and all this type of direct action stuff that, that really matters. It really does seem like people are geographically locked out of that type of organizing. Um, and I don't know, maybe, hmm, maybe it, it comes with being able to like uproot and move like where I'm from in Phoenix, Arizona, there's just not, that scene just kind of doesn't exist. Um, I had kids at an early age and I started a family young. So maybe that, that could have been part of it. Why I, I did have these roots that kind of kept me there, but I was always, or I always felt locked out of that type of organizing. And then the other type of organizing was always just like performative bullshit. Um, and so I don't know, I have no idea. I'm, I, I'm not speaking as one who has a depth of knowledge on the subject, but I do know that it seems to be the case that we need theory we we need to come together in spaces and figure out new forms 
of action. I do know that the mode of production has changed. I do know that the type of alienation and estrangement that we all, all of us, every single one of us is faced with on a daily basis has changed. It is not the same as it was a hundred years ago. So the same modes of action and organizing are just impossible. Like it, it, it just, we can't have a, a broad movement for for solidarity and, and um, everyone join a workers union and, and everyone join some local chapter of of, of some organization because they they just don't exist anymore. Um, and I do see a lot of people acting as if that change hasn't occurred, acting as if their specific project is the most radical thing in the world and if you're not engaged in that pro uh in that project you're a fascist um and that's crazy to me i found a lot of personal improvement and a lot of what what i feel is personal emancipation in theory in actually taking the time to read and, and study and work rigorously to figure out these old ideas and to figure out some new ideas. Um, and the hope is there that, that we can apply it at, at some point in the future to a broad movement. Um, but, but right now, it, it just, there is no broad movement. There's, there's 8 billion different projects that everyone thinks, everyone has their own idea of what's going on and the world has been shattered into 8 billion little pieces. Um, and big and small, you know, disagreements range from like ontology and like fundamental basis of the universe itself to, to the smallest things. Um, and they're equally divisive. And we have to figure out a way to be human once again um, before we can even talk about some type of universal human solidarity. And I just, I, I really believe we, we must necessarily do that through thinking and through theorizing. And I think, I, I mean, praxis, I think this is praxis. I think driving around the country and meeting with other people and talking is the type of praxis that. I can engage in. I think Dave and Ann um, are engaging in it. I think, I mean, practice necessarily you have theory and action together. So I don't think you can throw organizing out the window altogether. I, I think we necessarily need people who are doing the hard work that is affecting people every single day in real ways, giving them food, giving them homes, giving them a shoulder to cry on. These things are undeniable and I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade them for the world but that's not enough. Um, we have so many discrete movements going on and, and no broad narrative that can bring them together. And, and I hope we can, because if not, we're all fucked. <laughs> uh, so Dave's going to come up <laughs> and talk about what he's going to talk about. And then we'll get into the panel. Thank you, guys. That clapping was for me coming up here. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't. It wasn't for Nance. Give it up for Nance. Seriously, thank you, Nance. That was really good. Thank you. Um. So. While the camera battery gets changed out, I know it's crazy. We're running this thing on a battery. It's he's a the other day in Phoenix. There's a lot of things that got left in Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this will be the only writing from moratorium that goes public, um, or that has gone public, or that will, you know, so far. So moratorium is a book I wrote after Waypoint, which was my first. Um, and it was written in during 2020 and 2021. 
basically a period of burnout and disaffection. And I felt resentment and I felt betrayal and I felt a bunch of things that I don't want to put to print to make public, to have that be my vibe that I'm putting out there. I didn't want to um, attract that kind of an audience really. Right. I look for people who are like, where well, we're fucked. And right. Like Nance is a perfect example of the kind of person I'm hoping to attract is as opposed to people who are just angry and resentful or reactionary. Right. Um, but whether it was the woke scolds in these various identitarian groups on campus or the so-called class reductionists at these older, I, these other organizations that, you know, try to, they reach back to the, the old left, right? They reach back to Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, Trotsky, Stalin, you know, it's a, usually a mixture of these, these various thinkers. Um, or Democrat grandmas. I was feeling gaslit. Because, first of all, everyone thinks that they're more left than me. And that's really annoying. Um, everyone thinks, I haven't been doing my readings. I haven't done the work. And that's annoying, right? Um, in a lot of these spaces, it sounded like I was really getting the opportunity to speak, to be heard. Um, and then I was getting like, these, these little history lectures. Um, and, and these lectures were usually about what's impossible and what's possible and what's just more of the same. And what, and for me, as someone who came to class consciousness through a strange labor, reading a strange labor by Karl Marx from his 1844 manuscripts, it's a fragment. It's a fragment where he is imminently critiquing Feuerbach. He's taking Feuerbach, who was like Richard Dawkins back then, and he's thinking him through and taking him to another level. And he's bringing that to a critique of the way that we work, the form, the estranged form of work that we engage in in a capitalist society. Um, and I related to it so strongly because I come from a family that never had more than $20 in the bank, right? We ate ramen for lunch, oatmeal for breakfast, same three dinners on repeat, for my whole childhood, you know, every once in a while it was like a special treat to go to McDonald's or something. Right. And I was also not supposed to go to college because I was supposed to be a waste of my time. Right. And so when I finally did go to college after burning out on working for a decade in entry level gigs, because I didn't have any credentials, um, I was finding this disconnect between where I was from and, and where I was trying to go. And I thought of myself as a socialist or as a, some kind of a, I mean, I, I think from a more Marxist standpoint, it was very utopian. It was like, well, we should all be able to get along together. I choose love over hate, love over fear, cooperation over competition, uh, horizontalism over hierarchy, uh, progress over regress. Like there's all these binaries and then you just take the left side of that binary. And that, I was for all those things. And obviously that put me at odds with my family, with my upbringing, which was very conservative. Um, but what a strange labor and other um, articles like that helped me discover was that my parents were not fully responsible for their beliefs. They were not fully responsible for their experiences. Um, not just my parents, but everybody who grew up in the neighborhood I grew up in was not responsible for their poverty. At a certain level, there's always some personal responsibility. Um, there are the people who choose to um, beat their kids and get shit faced drunk every night and whatever. Like, and then there's the people who try to do something else and then they go into some super fundamentalist Christian AM radio political conservative overdrive direction. Both are destructive in different ways. Which one's worse? I don't know. Genuinely, I don't know which is worse. 
um, because they can both be very bad in, in different ways. And it's hard to measure kinds of suffering uh, that come from what I call this, the structural stultification of time energy, which is to say, if you do not have what time energy is, large energy infused, repeatable blocks of time throughout your week, if you do not have that, then you cannot commit to getting to know people. You cannot commit to building relationships. You cannot commit to cooperative enterprises like um, a community garden or um, an actual co-op or, um, I mean, even the extracurricular activities at a school or at a church or the community and civic spaces themselves deteriorate. And we're not self-standing individuals. We are relationally constituted to a certain degree because our horizon of possibilities, how we move through the world into the future and the choices that we make are between what we think is possible, right? And so the constellation of possible realities that we can move towards is informed by the people that we grow up around and the things that they do. And if none of them have time energy and you don't have time energy, and then even if you did something amazing, they wouldn't have the time energy to actually recognize what you did. Um, there's a poverty there that can't just be described in purely material terms. And I hate to call it spiritual either, but there's something about the human spirit that perseveres through poverty nonetheless. And we all know that. And we see people finding a way to keep going on, but it's depressing. Um, it's depressing because it's not necessary. And we know it's not necessary. And it was Marx that really gave me the sense of class consciousness, of realizing that the people, a lot of them right-wingers, who had always blamed for all the problems in the world were actually themselves products of poverty. And uh, even if they bootstrapped it into the petty bourgeoisie, they had their own business at some point. Well, that was done with what? 30 years of wages saved up? Well, those wages were already exploited. They were already working overtime and getting underpaid and then saving what they could to get to the point where they could have their own business. And here at the university, I'm finding out activists just sneer down on them and act like they're the same as the big capitalist guy, right? And also at the same time, scapegoating them as the ones responsible for everything bad in the world. So I was burning out on that. And the reason I brought up the three grandmas is because within a year, and that uh, this is 2020. Within a year, I met, or not, I, I already knew all three of these wonderful women. Um, and they are wonderful women, but um, they're really into mainstream media, New York Times, um, CNN, whatever. And, uh, you know, one reads the newspaper every day. Another, it's okay. You're okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we, we will ignore you though. <laughs> it's too late. I already messed it up. I shouldn't have acknowledged her. Um, these three women were in different states, in different areas, in different kinds of neighborhoods, but they were all between middle class and upper middle class. They were all in their uh, 50s through upper 70s. And they, so, so, so the, there's some diversity here in terms of like their background their class standing, but for the most part, they were following standard Democrat news sources and they had all seen me in 2016. Well, with the exception of one, they'd all seen me in 2016, go, go for Bernie. And they were seeing me do it again in 2019 during the primary season. And their attitude was the exact same as it had been back in 2016. So whether it's the grandmas, the Marxists, or the Radlibs, the across the board, no one's opinions changed between 2016 and 2020. Nothing new happened, right? Nothing new. It's all just the same bourgeois politics. He made the mistake of entering the Democratic Party or from the grandma's position, um, he undermined Hillary. She would have won if it wasn't for him. And it's like, well, I wouldn't have even 
been politically active if it wasn't for him. Right. From the Marxist side, oh, well, he's just bourgeois politics. He's working within the the system. It's there's no future there. And I'm going, you guys can't out Marx me. I know that when Marx was writing, there was an already existing working class movement, you stupid fucking pieces of shit. There's not one today. I know, sorry, everyone jumps. There's not a working class movement today. It took Bernie, right? It took that. Um, and so it was just, it was so frustrating to be getting, oh, he, there's nothing new there. Or, oh, he's just this old white dude. Or, oh, he's not this, that, or the other thing enough. And it's like, this is it right now. Like when Doug Lane last night in Portland said that Corbin, uh, sorry, that Mark Fisher's politics the limit of his politics was Corbynism. Can you close it? Um, there's like noise coming through it. The, the limits of Mark Fisher's politics was Corbynism. What he meant by that was that in, uh, in Britain, Mark Fisher, who's a thinker on the left who passed away a few years ago, uh, he wrote Capitalist Realism, right? Um, the limit of his politics was basically Bernie. Corbyn's compared to Bernie, right? He's just part of the Labor Party. Um, which is also not really a future that beyond capitalism. It's a, it's, it's a slightly nicer face for capitalism that at least dignifies workers. At least it doesn't do what the Democrats tend to do today, which is just forget that they exist altogether, right? So a little bit of representation, a little bit of recognition, but beyond that, what is there? Well, I mean, maybe some healthcare. It'd be nice to have that at least, right? But when... Doug says that the limit of his politics was Corbynism. I think the same thing I thought when people were saying, oh, well, Bernie's not the answer, which is just like, yeah, well, no fucking shit, dude. But, you know, working class movements don't come out of nowhere. You actually have to take steps. And if this is the only thing that anyone's been able to step forward and do concretely, in a hundred fucking years since Eugene Debs, then cool. I'm going to go out there and knock on doors because when Marx wrote A Strange Labor, there were, there were already existing working class institutions, there were class schools, there were working class soup kitchens, there were working class churches. Working class people were shut out of involvement or rights in civic society. And so they created their own institutions. They had their own movements already. And he was saying, great. Let's try to direct that. Let's work with that. And then what you get now is when someone starts organizing the working class or trying to speak to the working class and get it actually like think at a level of class consciousness, like universal deliverable um, goods. Oh, but are they, are they quoting Lenin? They're not quoting Lenin. Well, they're not quoting Lenin. So it couldn't get us beyond capitalism, right? And it's like, oh, well, you know what? People quoting Lenin for the last hundred years hasn't gotten people to get out of their comfort zone and actually try to do something, right? And so what, are, what am I trying to say about these grandmas? I keep going back to these Marxists, right? Well, on the one side, I've got these Marxists saying, oh, he's not revolutionary enough. And I've got these rad libs saying, oh, he's too white. He's too old. He's too male. Um, and on the other side, these grandmas are all like, it'll just never happen. It's impossible. He's, he's too old. He's too white. He's too male. They, they say those things too, or because they know it's me and that's not going to work really. They're just going to say, well, America just really isn't socialist. It's just, it really couldn't go for socialism. It's, it's just never going to happen, you know, or it'd be too expensive or, you know, just these kinds of things telling me what's possible, telling me what's the limit. Right. And fucking like what? Less than a year later after Bernie drops out, which I considered to be a betrayal a year after he takes all of our donations and turns it over to the Democrats. That was like a real betrayal. I didn't, the Marxists in my life were all like, he had already done that. He already went around and did stump speeches for Hillary. He did more speeches than she did for her campaign. Yeah, but he said he would do that. 
And that was a trade-off so that he could remove the superdelegate block. So it was actually strategic at the time. The second capitulation was something else though. Him sitting there all defeated with his mask on, that was something else, right? Giving way to COVID and, res- and Trump resistance and undirected protests, right? Undirected. It was like he tried to do something at the time, but he didn't. So I did feel betrayed in that sense. But less than a year later, right? Was that, am I right on my timeline here? Yeah, the Capitol siege, which was what? A bunch of right-wingers and libertarians and politically disaffected people go rush the Capitol and try to take back what's properly theirs, freedom, you know? And it was comical, you know? I thought it was funny. I thought, too bad we can't do that. Too bad too bad the left didn't do that. But the, and it was funny because like, that's not where the levers of power are. You know, I have enough theory to know that that it ain't there guys. You know, this is a stunt. This is a promotional stunt for a bunch of influencers and their followers. Um, And it's going to help the FBI tighten their security apparatus and preempt future organizing efforts. It's not actually going to concretely do anything. Um, And I knew that. Uh, but watching AOC talk about how she was terrified for her life was like, that was also funny. It's like, they weren't going to kill you. All right. But I mean, like the shaman guy, come on. And if anybody remembers Buffalo guy, with the face paint and stuff, do you, if you watch the video, uh, interview with channel five news, um, and him in, in prison, uh, He's just one of those guys you meet, man. I mean, you meet those people under bridges. You meet those people at the workplace before they end up under the bridge. Like, you know, it's it's probably a little bit of schizophrenia um, or at least just a whole lot of acid and conspiracy theories, right? I mean, come on. Um, harmless, harmless, harmless people, but they are suffering and they want something exciting and they want something to give them hope and they're reaching and they're not really being directed by anybody who will speak to them. And so instead they just go off in this Looney Tunes direction. The Biden administration and every, every like mainstream outlet starts outside of Fox starts referring to this event as the most dangerous thing that's happened since the civil war repeatedly. Over and over and over again. It was like, the this is the biggest attack against democracy since the Civil War. And all of these grandmas who were just saying that Bernie was too radical for the last five years start saying, we might have to have a Civil War. They all said this to me. And I was like, Bernie's too radical for you but you'd go to civil war to kill those people. And the thing is, is I know that there's a bunch of leftists online who would agree with them. They'd say, yeah, like we have to, we have to unite with the the liberals against these fascist, neo-fascist types of enemies. And it's like, they were talking the same way about the trucker convoy. Right. And it's like, you guys want to kill them. Like that's the, Hate Inc., Matt Taibbi's Hate Inc., the book that we're all reading for the Critical Media Theory um, lecture that's coming up this in a couple weeks here. Um, It's about how the monopoly uh, mainstream media society of general consensus and, uh, you know, the, uh, the silent majority, how this has moved out of one of like a mass society towards one of it's really just about like, hey, they're way worse than we are. It's lesser evilist. We sell you hate of the other. And so then the monopoly society becomes the duopoly society. Red versus blue. It was always red versus blue, but now it's it's being so it's hate being commodified. And uh, the other is being scapegoated. And so that's the space that moratorium came out of was me writing this thinking, 
Even the grandmas who thought that Bernie was too radical now want to kill my fucking parents. Right? And it's not their fault that they live in this society. It's not their fault. And guess what? That kind of civil war that would come out of a culture war has no future. There's no possible future for that kind of civil war except for more of the same once the rebels cleaned up. And so I wrote this mostly facing the Marxists in my life, but that's because the Marxists in my life are the ones who actually want to change things structurally, not just statistical outcomes, which is a way that we talk about systemic oppression today, but no, structurally change things so as to eradicate um, the kinds of inequities that we face. It's called our historical situatedness, which just means like the place we are in history. Why the situation is different from what Marx was looking at or responding to, how this calls old solutions into question, and what any new perspective, proposals, or plan of action must first take to heart. I'm not going to apologize that this is going to go a little long, because it will, but we will still have time. We will still have time. The first one, high modernism is wrong. Pseudoscientific, and worse of all for Marxists, Utopian as it gets. So what is high modernism? The belief that all problems can be rationally solved by formalistic procedures, top-down administration that works in one place and therefore should work everywhere else, where one person or group can dictate what ought to be done and, because they are the most scientific, those proposals will work everywhere. This comes from a specific time of scientific optimism bolstered by the tremendous gains and astonishing horror ignited by the march of industrialization. What it runs up against are the limits of formalistic knowledge, science, and planning. What works in one county does not in another. The corn that grows best in Massachusetts does not grow well in Idaho. The shit that can grow everywhere is less tasty and is literally empty of nutritional content, as in dead calories. Though this is common knowledge for ecologists today, it was not something the likes of Lenin, Ford, or Le Cabousier, I forget how to say that motherfucker's name, Cabousier, could fathom. All they saw were the successes of high modernism immortalized in the cathedrals of labor known as factories. The Soviet attempt to clear cut forests and then grow only the kinds of wood they immediately needed was just one example of this failure to understand the base complexity and nature of the seemingly useless flora and fauna that sustained growth while evading direct empirical function. Though post-colonial though post-colonial thinkers have in many ways taken this analogy too far with their neo-reactionary conception of organic cultural structures that have their own sense of time and language habitation, they nevertheless see and acknowledge something lost on Marxists who, like Christian Yankee evangelicals, would prefer a world where everyone speak the same language, and preferably one without metaphor, poetry, or much cultural particularity outside of their own. The same high modernists who saw difference as something to be overcome saw nature as disorderly. Nature proved this shit wrong and it resulted in tremendous. This is not good. I keep losing my spot. This is, I'm going to have to abort mission here. The same high modernists who saw the dif who saw difference as something to be overcome saw nature as disorderly. Nature proved this shit wrong and it resulted in tremendous hardship for the Soviet Union just as it did Mao's China. Likewise, humans prove to not be programmable machines who simply need the correct inputs to make the world revolution. Difference and infinity get overblown by Derrida and Levinas, but they are counteracting the opposite, which is a mode of theorizing that was stupid and destined to failure because it was simplistic, pseudoscientific, and utopian, all while calling itself scientific. It's the immortal science of Marxism-Leninism. It's got all the answers, right? I get that all from James Scott's Seeing Like a State. It's case study after case study of his field work. Um, and I think that it needs to be dwelt with, tarried with, right? If you believe in social engineering or top-down planning, then bottom-up autonomy and knowledge matters and needs to be incorporated into any plausible theory.
Next point, no Charles Dickens world. The working class is as fractured as modern slums, which is very different from how they did things in old cities in, that had ghettos. Um, there's, ghettos still exist, but modern slums are div subdivided, dispersed, and hidden away so that those who live in these ghetto shards are not interned in mass. I mean the mobile home parks hiding behind random industrial buildings and department st stores across the newer cities, right? Developers learned a long time ago to not put all the poor people in one place. The proletariat is likewise dispersed across the globe, and the internet does not actually raise the possibility of us seeing one another and feeling our power. Next point, the radical potential anarchist programmers see the radical potential that anarchist programmers see in the internet in the construction of open source software, for instance, tends to lose sight of the way these are presupposed and co-opted by companies who rely on this free labor. More importantly, the internet is irredeemably anti-communist. The handful of Looney Tune online influencers who keep saying they represent the interests of the workers while acting like nothing has fundamentally changed in the last hundred years only prove the point for everyone else who knows in their gut that these people are out of touch. And I'm one of those, by the way, I, I'm, I, this is fully self-incriminating. But this is still only the tip of the iceberg. Insofar as there is a working class that could gain mass, it is fundamentally incapable of coming to self-consciousness and organizing in any previously tried ways because of the following factors. First, functional illiteracy. As in nobody reads anything but advertisements and entertainment or if nonfiction, then usually as a literalist who is paying attention to a specific ideological line for the first time ever, usually, right? Reading takes the form of memorization to bolster a presupposed view. Um, this is apologetics in religion, right? It's not for understanding critically from a variety of perspectives that fundamentally call into question the frames, subjects, and context of the text in question. This is a problem for everyone because of time energy saltification, as well as the next thing. And so time energy saltification, I already unpacked that. Basically, you don't have it. And because you don't have it, other people don't have it. Even if you had it because other people don't have it, you really don't have it. It would take a society where that's actually there because there, then there would be institutions built around our expenditure of time energy, right? The next thing is the education system, which was constructed not to empower, but to divide, subdue, and co-opt revolutionary potential into a kind of class society that had to be constructed through a regime of public education that was inconceivable in Marx's time, though the seeds had been planted by German idealists like Schelling. Whereas the early conception was one that would make people more legible to the state, easier to predict and therefore preempt or control, the U.S.'s adaptation of that Prussian model was done in light of socialist organizing with the express purpose to create two classes of people. As Woodrow Wilson put it in 1910, I think it was more like 1909, in direct, or maybe seven, in, he says, in, and I think when I wrote this, I just didn't want to pull the quote. And so what I do here is I paraphrase it. So you know, if you want the real quote, it is in the Time Energy book. But as he put it, we want one class of persons to have a liberating education, and we want another class of persons, a much, a very much larger class of necessity in every society, to forego the privileges of a liberating education and fit themselves to perform specific, difficult manual tasks. End quote. This first class is made up of accomplished, competent, and even sometimes, and by the way, that was the exact quote. I just replaced the word liberal with liberating because I don't want to get things twisted. We think liberal, and we go, oh, liberal. The liberal arts means the liberating arts. That's the sense being used there. This first class is made up of accomplished, competent, and even sometimes intelligent tryhards who reify meritocracy and presuppose this division of labor in everything they say and do, no matter how much they might purport to want the abolition of class. Whether right or left, the PMC, professional managerial class, is self-assured that they have earned their place and that it is simply the other side's fault that more genuinely deserving like-minded people are not in their department, bureau, or C-suite. Uh, Thomas here likes to use professional managerial caste 
I think that there's a lot of a lot of good a lot of good in that idea. I I also just say the professional managers of capital as a way of evading the cast versus class question altogether. Next one, consumerism. Capitalism adapted in ways unforeseen by Marx by producing an endless variety of new addictions that could have never been imagined. Though, of course, I do believe that McGowan's and Zizek's critical understanding of how this works, combined with time energy as a master signifier, deal a blow to this. But that is necessarily not something that will come with a rushed revolution anytime soon, because one, revolutionaries seem the least capable of understanding the necessity of time energy or the problems that it counters. On this tour, I would say I have mixed feelings about that statement because I've had mixed results. Two, rushed revolutions undermine the conditions for socialism, which are abundance. And three, it takes time for a concept to become viral in a way that detonates a regime of commodity fetishism. I do think that time energy can do that if we just give it our time energy. Last, and this is, well, this is not last, but this is like a, a direct follow-up. Part of consumerism, but deserving its own place in this list because it was a problem independent of consumerism. Marxists had no theory of subjectivization, social reproduction, desire, or ideology beyond the homo economicus who is under false consciousness, meaning that it just believes things that are wrong and that it, it serves the, it serves, you know, you believe in th uh, stories that work, to the advantage of a different class. These, as well as what gets called postmodern critique of representation, all are developed by post-Marxist French theorists, often called post-structuralists or postmodern. Every single one of these theorists has their own theory of how Marxism failed to adequately conceptualize, formulate, or work through each of these lacunae. I am putting all of these onto one point, when in reality, each theorist who develops a theory or critique on the basis of these issues or their correlates is a force to be reckoned with who sees things that must be taken into account for any revamped project that aims at genuinely plausible social engineering. So like Lacan on drive, uh, Leotard on libidinal economy, Derrida on difference, Levinas on infinity over totality. Like these are all basic critiques of standard worldview Marxism that Marx himself, if he was born today, would have to sit in a library for 20 years and actually grind through and find a way to sublate into a new theory, right? These so-called postmodernists are not trying to foil Western society as Peterson and Hicks think, but are merely diagnosing the changed conditions that the old left failed to acknowledge, theorize, or address, which resulted in the general incredulity towards meta narratives. This takes us to the next point distrust. As in, we live in a post trust society where the only people who believe ideologies or institutions wholeheartedly are dupes, literalists, fundamentalists, unhinged weirdos, or wannabe heroes stuck in the past, desperately clinging to a worldview that will explain everything. I pointed at myself for the last couple of those because, like I said, this is self critique. Cynical ideology factors in here. Moreover, simply the fact that no amount of lesser evil contrivance makes any side less the liars, the media more believable, or will cause the overwhelming masses to feel less gaslit by the it's just so simple crowd. This relates to the next one outside of this subcategory of factors that irredeemably fracture the working class. McLuhan is correct that modern media developments invert the base superstructure relation in a way lost on traditional Marxists. This is in his Understanding Media, which is his most important work of media theory. Um, yesterday, Doug Lane said that McLuhan is a bourgeois thinker. He said that in passing, which was interesting because it's like, is that saying that we shouldn't engage with him? Because all of Marxism comes out of sublating bourgeois thinkers who were seeing things that nobody else was seeing. Something about the privilege and luxury of being a gentleman and a scholar or a man of letters and a polymath makes it so that a bourgeois thinker usually can see things that other people under harsher conditions is not are not capable of seeing, right? There is wisdom to be gained from bourgeois thinkers. Um, McLuhan is onto something that the base superstructure relation has inverted. 
What is the base superstructure relation? In short, base has to do with the productive material conditions, right? The means of production and the relations of production, as opposed to the superstructure, which is like the culture, the things we say we, we believe, the, the reasons we say we do what we do. Baudrillard saw the writing on the wall, but everyone else is acting like they didn't get the memo. Perhaps it is buried in their 10,000 unread emails. Probably, considering the fact... Fuck you. That the age of information oversaturation, TMI, necessitates tactics that subjectivize us in ways that make mass unification on or around much, not only impossible but really only impossible for anything that seeks to counter or replace capitalism by way of unification on the basis of an understanding of complexity, right? It's just saying that the stakes are raised, the situation is harder, and what we have ahead of us is something that is going to be a serious undertaking. Next, Marxists practically invented propaganda, but they never mastered it. Insofar as shutting down the press of your enemies goes, fascists perfected that model. However, both communists and fascists lost the propaganda war because repression, coupled with calls for loyalty and othering, only get you so far for so long. The true winners of that game were advertising and capitalist democratic duopoly media, which both learned a long time ago that reasoning with audiences matters less than populating the horizon of possibilities and references with false choices. Make everyone have to choose an identitarian, an identitarian stand vis-a-vis -vis your logo, and it does not matter if they subscribe. What matters is that insofar as X number will not, the next one will. It is simply a numbers game where consent is not the only thing manufactured, but desire, identity, and resentment, resentment too. So I was writing this for myself. I hadn't made this popular yet. That's why I don't explain in it things like raisonnement. But like the basic idea is like it's a way of turning your own weakness into a strength by just saying that the person who's stronger than you is actually bad because strength is bad, right? You do that in other ways as well. Everyone does that. Deleuze thinks it goes all the way down and that it's actually the origin of consciousness itself is in this movement of raisonnement, which is a fascinating proposition. I don't care about that. That Nothing I'm saying hinges on that, but Desire, identity, and Um, These are these things that the media sells us. This works for churches and commodities, for ideological spinoff groups who pose themselves as cult-like solutions to the mainstream, but this does not work to unify despite difference, especially not for the working class who is, like everyone else now, born-again consumers. I come back to this point about the internet being irredeemably anti-communist, I think that it's something that you can't really have click for you until you read like this non-standard history of the internet that Yasha Levine develops in Surveillance Valley. But the tech bros and intelligence um, functionaries who were more scared of communism than anything else, who were involved in the construction of the internet, um, were, yeah, they were super anti-communist. and. The whole thing has been developed to undermine any way of really like unifying. So um, it's obviously driven by business and advertising, but it is irredeemably anti-communist. And so I think that like turning on a camera and talking about doing a revolution is very similar when you're doing it over the internet. It's very similar to going to the front lobby of the Pentagon with your friends and trying to plan a revolution or going into like the CIA headquarters and saying, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. And so when you see people standing there saying, it's easy, kids, we can do the revolution. It's like, who are you working for? Because you're probably doing DIY propaganda for what you genuinely believe in, but also this is not a safe space for this kind of conversation. Right. I didn't know that. I did not always know that. Like I said, it's self critique. So um, you notice I did not read that one. Um, I'm going to just kind of skip over. I already said it right here. Uh, I already said earlier what I have right here is just that um, when Lenin stormed the Winter Palace and there was like nobody in there, they actually got hold of the state. 
like there were some soldiers, but like for the most part, power was in this moment of it, it was weak. It was really fucking weak. And they could actually storm the Winter Palace. But you've stormed the fucking capital today. That is not where the deep state is. So good luck. You think that it's about the elected representatives? That you actually think that they're in that Capitol building? They, they're not. So I'm going to skip past like four of these other points and, and finish with the expanse. Um, what's the name of the dude you're saying Lenin Gulag Bogdanov is an exception to what the rule is here, but it's, it's this concept that I named after a TV show and book series in the world of fiction, The Expanse. So I said, the expanse had not been registered by any of the thinkers in the old left, nor by its heirs today. What is the expanse? I'll get into it in a second. Infinite growth on a finite planet is not possible is something said by people who are, for all practical purposes, living in a previous century. They might as well be geocentric. Their ideology and perspective is incapable of registering the fact that we have already landed on the moon, Mars, and asteroids. Mining missions are already in motion. These people think we will run out of oil before we find new forms of energy to harness for space travel. They do not understand that capitalism could keep doing its thing for another million years. Socialism might have its place on some spaceships or earthly communes, but those will be among a plurality of other existing social experiments going on, like the space Mormons and the earthly Amish. And so the TV show and the book series, The Expanse, actually has like a, like a faction of spaceships that belong to the Mormons, right? It's fucking hilarious, right? But there's the people who are based out of Mars, the people who are based out of Earth, and then the people who mine on the belt. And uh, the fact that there's like Mormons in space, it's like, no, I've, I mean, that's the most realistic way of looking forward. Like there will be cultural difference in spaceships that go off planet and people will evolve in different directions. Humans are not going to just all coalesce and we'll all become the same blob and then we'll move into this like Star Trek. No, like we're all going to evolve in very different directions. And I hope that the spaceship we all get to go off on is going to be the coolest one of them all, but it's unlikely we even get to go. It's more likely we're going to get left in heaps of trash and radioactive garbage. I'm being redundant at this point, but um, it'll be like, like Wally world, but we, we won't get off planet. The by and large spaceships will not include us, Right. They will, uh, they'll be looking at our applications to get on board or the applications of our children's children to get on board the spaceship. And then they'll go, we see that you went to that meeting in Seattle back in 2023. Sorry, we don't want you to, to come on our spaceship. And then we'll be left to fight each other over water, like in Mad Max. And so what I'm hoping is that whatever we actually do practically throughout our lives sets us up to be able to have dignified lives, even if that is the case. But at the same time, I also hope that we can figure out a way of communicating with the people who do get to go off on the spaceships that'll make them want to take us with them and not leave us in radioactive piles of trash fighting over water. That is what I hope. Um, I'm going to skip ahead and then just say, the old left did not simply fail because it tried too early because of outside, outside sabotage or due to the bad personalities or motives of corrupted insiders. Those all had their place in its downfall, and obviously any repeated attempt to do as Lenin or some other revolutionary did would have to show how the conditions are more ripe, how the plausibility is more sound than before. And this would have to be articulated by people capable of taking to heart the above listed changes, right? To take to heart does not mean simply deflate, dismiss, or attempt to debunk each point in isolation from one another. It means taking the whole black pill and sitting with it, allowing oneself to let go of immediate application and objectives to see the world through the eyes of those who had to come to terms with or first articulate the changes and problems unseen or left out of prior theory. It means doing a period of moratorium on revolutionary and personality politics. It means taking our specific historical situatedness seriously. Take failure seriously. 
Don't brush it off and act like we can just jump back up and keep going. The idea that we don't have time to think is a marketing ploy by people who think we're too stupid to realize the universe is basically infinite in scope and resources. The insistence that we act now is the motto of arrested development. But maturity understands that if we do not have time, then we certainly do not have time to act like we do not have time. That became like my mantra that it got me through 2020, I think. Because everyone was saying, no, act, 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 act. we have no time. I was like, I've been in that mindset for like seven years. It, it doesn't work. We ha- if, if we really don't have time, then we really don't have time to act like we don't have time. Considering the above listed facts of our unique historical situatedness, Marx's purported solution, that is the dictatorship of the proletariat, which he never rigorously theorized, is clearly one that must be suspended and critically worked through. Obviously, if the situation changes, then the solution might prove no longer plausible, preferable, or wise. If the proletariat is not a concentrated mass, then what is meant by this term? So I go on and on and on, and I want to get to the panel, and I don't want to lose it here. So what I hope that this has done is give you a sense that... um, these are the problems that I'm thinking through. This is where I'm coming from. And if the old left was focused on labor and the new left was focused on anti-war and civil rights, then the real question is, what's the next left? Okay, because labor's still there. Civil rights are still there. These will never go away. But right now and for the last... 15 years, I mean, really since Occupy, actually, it's been like the argument is over old left versus new left, but new left is also very old at this point. So what's the next left? And then I have to even wonder, is left a useful term? Because it left, we associate with all of these terms that really don't have anything to do with the working class, right? Culturally, values are diverse. People are torn between liberal and conservative values. People are mixtures of these things. The parties that speak to only one or the only other, one or the other only speak to portions of the population, not really to everybody, right? So someone's like, oh, I'm just all progressive. Or someone's like, oh, I'm all conservative. And it's like, yeah, you're not like most people. Most people aren't like you at all, right? So what gives instead of what's next left, we were talking about, we're interested in human future. What would human future look like? What kind of a way forward makes human futures possible? And I add the plural there, the S at the end of futures, because I, of what I said earlier, I think there's going to be a lot of people to get off planet and go in different directions. And who knows what will, who knows what will become of the Mormons? I don't know. I wish them the best. If we cross paths in the stars, then I hope we'll help each other out. If like, you know, if they have like their like alarm beacon, their distress beacon going off, we'll come and help them and vice versa. I hope, I hope we'll all be good uh, fellow travelers out in those harsh conditions. And remember, as we prepare to go into that future, we're already in space. And there will be people who don't want to leave planet. And there will be people who don't want to augment their bodies and become cyber people. And there will be people who want to maintain old biologically bounded categories of what it means to be a man or a woman. There will be. They're not going to go away. I genuinely just don't believe it'll go away ever. And that means that if that, for instance, becomes a make or break issue between who you will or will not organize with, then that's suicide. It's movement suicide. So in the same way that we talk nowadays about thought terminating cliches, I think that we also have to be aware of movement terminating cliches. And that's why we did the thing yesterday on hypostition in Portland. And if you didn't see that, definitely check it out. But as far as my presentation goes, that's it. Thank you. Uh, We have the space until 4 p.m. Carl probably has to leave the soonest. I want him to be able to uh, start this thing out, share his thoughts, 
Um, and then we'll kind of engage in a panel. Thomas as well. I know you just wrote a piece about the dictatorship of the proletariat and rethinking it. And I just said that we need to rethink it. And so very excited about your guys' takes on all of that. But if you also have thoughts prepared on theory versus practice and not related to our talks, we, we want to hear you out. So please welcome to the panel our own, uh, not our own, but like visiting or I don't know, anarchists and socialists who are going to, yeah, honor us. Yeah. We're the ones who are visiting. They're residents. Okay. They're residents. We're visiting. Anne's ready for the panel over at the at the little table. Actually, if you can get everyone on that side of Dave. Everyone on that side? Yeah. That's that. That's I'll Dave. go sit. I'll go sit way over there. I don't want to. Okay. I sit back. Maybe we can start out with like, you got to introduce yourselves and, uh, and, and take some thoughts. We'll start out. Oh, and then just and I can just on. Just Yeah, introductions and kind of opening thoughts, kind of stuff I'm talking about. This is a good microphone. Yeah, just for the computer audio. All right, awesome. Hi. Uh, yeah. So, uh, my name is uh, Thomas Jones. Um, I. Uh, have been a socialist for probably the better part of a decade now. Um, I spent, a, I think I, my first sort of experience with left organizing was at Occupy. Um, but then I kind of, you know, went, went to sleep for a little bit and then um, was organizing a bit uh, with Socialist Alternative here in Seattle. Um, and uh, sort of through the, through the process of that, I think that some, some sort of disagreements or differences um, came to the surface. And so now I'm a member of DSA. I have to admit though that I, um, while I think that there is a path forward for um, communism, like I've, I've, I've strongly opinionated about that. Um, I also have to admit that it does seem like we're kind of at ground zero here, you know, like everything. I think the joke is that um, you know the DSA is it's uh, five NGOs in a in a trench coat, you know. So um, um, and so that's kind of where we're at, where a lot of things are sort of uh, very fractured. And so um, yeah, just want looking forward to um, talking about theory versus praxis and also um, my work and uh, Carl's work. So here you go, Carl. Um, so yeah, my name is Carl Eugene Stroud, and I am an anarchist militant. I mostly, uh, most of my militancy is uh, related to political education. So um, a lot of what I do is with an organization called the Center for Especifismo Studies, where we do a 15-week seminar in the spring to uh, learn about a, we, we study a text from an organization in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And we study it uh, together through several weeks as a 15 week process. And um, through doing that, what we do is kind of use the text as a site to revisit together in order to develop uh, collective methods of uh, analyzing. And we recently finished a, uh, a new project that uh, we call, uh, it's, it's part of a long-term project called the North American Anarchist Primer. And we just finished the first step of that which we call first grade and in that what we did was we've developed a um a collective voice which is we treat like a tool so um through our discussions we uh we take notes very thoroughly and analyze uh an excerpt from a from a text and then through that analysis we uh produce a bunch of ideas that are not necessarily coherent or like have a cohesion within themselves. And then we um, kind of run that through this process, this method that we have developed in order to produce a final thing that takes those ideas and turns them into something more coherent. So the final thing is not any one's ideas. It's not any one's writing. It, we use the voice and the theory of both our specific organization of the people who were actually in the meeting. And then on top of that, of our international uh, tendency, our international political tendency. So um, 
Yeah, we're, we're really interested, especially like when it comes to theory in terms of how we treat theory like a tool. Um, and not just as a tool that like, oh, it's useful for this and that, but as a tool because it actually needs to be picked up and used. So uh, that's one thing I would say, at least to like jump in here about like uh, theory and praxis or theory and practice. And that like, um, I would say that we, you know, if we don't treat theory like a tool, uh, one example that we've, we've, um, used a lot it comes initially from an organization in Uruguay and they uh they talk about how if a worker gets a new a new lathe or let's say in this case a new power drill or something like this some tool that they use right and then instead of using the tool they just talk to everyone about how cool it is and how new it is and that's all that it is is this really cool awesome thing to show off it's not actually something to use and learn to use differently and maybe take to different places um that that's actually not, not any better than the worker who refuses to buy a new tool because of the way they've always done it because oh well in the past i used this one tool and it's the one that worked the best and i don't want to learn about new tools so both of those are a problem and i think that they're actually like a problem related to the conception of theory outside of practice that we need pro, uh, political practice to like and and this is something else i would i would maybe add in here is that I think that it could help to use the adjective political more often rather than immediately referring to politics. I think that politics is usually a kind of, um, uh, let's say, a synthesis or some kind of combination of, of ideology and theory, and that uh, political as a modifier allows us to say political theory, Ooh. political ideology, political practice. So in that way, like I'd also like to distinguish between um, just opinions, which we could maybe call like personal opinions and political opinions, which actually need to be formulated with other people. That that there is, what use is forming a political opinion on your own? It, it basically uh, pigeonholes your political practice into being just persuading people of your idea. And so best case scenario, you're an asshole. You know, like, I mean, th that's literally the only thing that can come from that. So that's why, like, um, I think that something that sometimes is missed in uh, this way of, of maybe speaking from a philosophical perspective is that we're not situating ourselves. And from a situation, a political unity is sort of implied, meaning that, like, you can't just come to a situation and already have these political ideas that you're meaning to put in there and force. Instead, like, they they are produced out of that situation. And so likewise with theory, I would say that it's less a matter of like um, uh, kind of developing theory in your for yourself or having theoretical opinions on your own and more about producing theory out of context. It, without that production aspect, then I don't, don't think that... Uh, what what we're doing is we're producing theory that doesn't have any um, any kind of modifier to it. But what we need is theory of practice, um, not just a practice of theorizing. Um, so yeah, even just kind of combining in there like the idea of, of theorizing is actually an activity that needs to be done, not uh, on one's own. And that anytime it seems like it's out of context or not situated in any way, we're basically just overlooking the context. There is context. So like, yeah, maybe even online, I would say that like, um, for sure, like, or maybe maybe when we talk about like, uh, like dialogue, if we think of dialogue as a tactic, I think that 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 tactically, that is maybe something that's not uh, misplaced to be on the internet. Right. But that as a tactic, that's just one tactic. Right. So like, yeah, that's why the revolution isn't on the Internet. It's not because there aren't tactics that can be played out in that situation, but that we need to be able to see that situation as a situation. The same way that we're here in this room right now in this situation, or if we think about um, the three of you on tour, that situation is a lot different than the broader uh, theory underground group or the broader underground theory like sphere. Right. And so what that means is that like y'all are in a situation and from that your cohesion is political unity.
it's how you decide together what to do and how to do it again, how to do it differently the next time. Mm -hmm. So you don't come up with these ideas outside of the space. They develop out of that situation. And it means that like, yeah, the way y'all decide how to do things, maybe other people in the broader space have things to add, but the idea that they um, uh, are, are going to be as relevant or that you need to take them as validly as you would take your uh, input from the situation is wrong. So it's, it's not a matter of not being able to hear or listen to the outside context, but being able to understand that you're situated and not everyone who has an interest is situated. Mm. So politics needs to be, political practice needs to be situated. It does no good to just have these principles and then try to take them into space. This, this uh, reminds me of, uh, sorry, this uh, reminds me of uh, Zizek's idea of uh, principled opportunism, um, right? Where you have, uh, you know, an organization that has all of these really good principles um but they use that as an excuse to do nothing um like so for example you might say something like well we're not going to um you know our principle is that we're not involved in the government so we're not going to actually run anybody for office anywhere or something like that um and i also think that um what you said about um uh you know theory as a, a theory as a tool and how you make use of tools right um that's interesting to me because that also implies something about theory as uh, capital, um, right? Because of course, if we're immediately thinking about capital as usually being embodied as means of production, and we're talking about means of the production of theory, <laughs> then we're also talking about theory as a form of capital under capitalism as well. Um, and I, and to connect that to your idea of a situation, if we're not in a situation where we can actually tie that theory into the broader uh, social context, the broader social situation into the broader movements of capital, then the theory is going to be inherently hampered by the fact that it can't make this kind of connection to what's actually going on in the realm of production. Um, and so uh, I wonder, so I have, I have sort of my own opinion about this, which is that um, what we need is a workers firm, not a multiplicity of um, various cooperatives, but a single workers firm. Um, upon which we can build um, sort of organizations that would explore both politics and theory. And for me, the difference between theory and politics is that theory uh, is um, really about uh, like theory could go all the way down to like quantum physics. It could be it could go as high or as low as it wants to. Politics is really about association. It's about uh, it's about how specific groups of people organize themselves together, and it's about how those. Uh, associations um, function, how they break down, how they build themselves back up again, um, and that sort of thing. And so that's where there's sort of th this sort of dividing line. You can have you can have politics without theory. You can have association without theory. I mean, that's I think that's kind of what identity politics in bourgeois society constructs itself as. It's basically like you just grab a hold of like the first identifying trait of like a group of people, and then that becomes the way that society ends up organizing itself without theory. And then bourgeois theory, and then hopefully socialist theory after that would be about overcoming these kinds of snap decisions that occur. Now, of course, the problem is that the ruling class does make use of um, these uh, divisions um, in society. And um, so that means that that sort of false consciousness, and, and you said you mentioned something about false consciousness. Um, I, I have to be put on my Catron hat just a little bit. False consciousness is actually the consciousness of what's true. So that's what's ironic about the, the word false consciousness is that um, when you have false consciousness, it's that you're mesmerized so much about, about what's true that you can't see what's possible. And so it's a false consciousness, not because the consciousness is about false things. It's a false consciousness because you aren't actually conscious, because to be conscious means being able to see the possibility in the situation. It's a lot clearer than the way he said it when he said it in Chicago. I was, I was very confused. I didn't know what he was talking about. So thank you. Yeah. yeah. So so that's that's the that's that's kind of what's going on there. Um, but anyway, um, so um, I got distracted by that. Um, so what what I'm kind of sort of getting at there is that when we're talking about this sort of theory versus praxis question, um, we have the difficulty both with theory as praxis and praxis as theory, because we don't even have a space in which to practice theory. So so I, I want to actually just disagree with this binary, 
of theory and practice. Because I think what happens is that you end up turning theory into ideology. And that this idea that it's valuable inherently is it, that it, it is part of this like perfect schema is already like making sort of ideological claims, which is fine. I'm, I, it's not the problem. The problem has to do with uh, it's I, I agree with you that politics has to do with association, but that it also has to do with collective decision making and collective action. And I think that's why like uh, the in in the political current, the, the anarchist current that I come out of is called Especifismo. And in Especifismo, what we do is we organize, we, we theorize around organizing in uh, kind of two, two directions, what we call organizational dualism. And the idea is that you are coordinating with the people that you uh, are able to build the most uh, political level unity with. So that would be unity around ideological unity. It would be theoretical unity. It would be uh, practical unity. So like that would be like related to strategic unity. Um, but that that's different. That kind of specific and situated unity is not broad and popular. And that is a contradiction, but it is that contradiction that's the one that needs to be dealt with in order to make... Uh, political action, something that actually mediates people's action and not um, some kind of top-down organization's action. So what we conceive of is, is actually like a triad of, of theory, ideology, and political practice. So that ideology has to do with, and, and again, yeah, yes, this is not uh, Marxism. And I think that a lot of times, especially in the U.S., we tend to conflate a lot of and, and I think it, it comes somewhat from like we see in all these discussions, like we use this term the left. And I think that like that's actually kind of problematic in the U.S. context, because I think it means something very specifically situated here. And that um, when we when we talk about the left, I, I wonder why not talk about the socialist movement? Why not talk about the workers movement? Why not talk about um, um yeah, like like social movements that that do exist or could exist, rather than um, speaking of the left in a way that forces, I, I think, into it, it forces political practice into camps, which, like again, will not situate grassroots action. It 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 turns politics into something that mediates people's action for them, rather than their ability to directly mediate their own action. So so I agree with you. I mean, the caveat, the the, the star like should be on everything I'm saying. I, I'm thinking about this dialectically. So it's not so my point is not to say, and um maybe this is more for the audience, it's not to say that there's a, you know, a harsh division between praxis and theory. Um that basically you don't have good praxis. Like the the metaphor that I was thinking about um was that earlier today was that the working class is a bit like uh, someone in a straitjacket. Um, and if you don't have a theory of how to get out of a straitjacket, well, what you'll end up doing is you'll just end up thrashing and exhausting yourself um, in, in the straitjacket. And so I feel like that's something that has been happening the past few years um, uh, in the U.S. political scene is that the working class has been thrashing itself into exhaustion in uh, the, the political straitjacket of the United States. My, I think that my sort so of... Can, can I ask, though, why is that a... I think that it, I, it's why I question not having a methodology, because without having that, we can't modify how we made the analysis. And that, again, like the theory needs to come from situated elements that are present, not from idealized elements that we wish were present. Right. And if we don't start from the situated uh, context, we actually can't tell the difference anymore what's actually there and what we've just said is there what we've just included in our description without what we call uh, in in anarchism conjunctural analysis so we need to be able to analyze the conjuncture meaning all the forces that are present and we need to be able to articulate a problem related to our objectives that are is that includes what the, the elements that we've listed in this conjuncture, that allows us to see how to use the elements in order to uh, instrumentalize our action. Instead of uh, kind of these, these platitudes of the working class, the proletariat, the 
uh, labor movement. I, I think that like those things are not wrong or, or don't, I'm not, I'm not doubting their existence, but I'm doubting the analysis that's not situated. The analysis that doesn't depend on an art explicit methodology, because I think that doesn't make it so the analysis can be produced by a collective. I think it makes it something that someone comes up with and then they have to tell people about. It. And that, that the only thing that can come from that is like I said, like, like uh, trying to convince other people of something. Even in a teaching sense, the pedagogy of that is entirely like, I've got it, let me give it to you. I've got it, let me give it to you. And, and I think that that is, is actually a way of avoiding politics. It's kind of trying to use ideology not to do politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that, yeah, like in a lot of ways, uh, that that would be a, a critique of many Marxist tendencies is that, that they're, through that binary and through this this conception, because because actually I do want to make a distinction of these three things pretty clearly and say that they're not the same because we need to see the difference between our values, our tools, and the actual actions that we're able to realize together, mm -hmm. and that conflating those in even in a, a sort of uh, dialectical uh, way of thinking about them, I think is is. Uh, it falls back into ideology. So just to check really quick with the listening side, are you all hearing Carl? Okay. Just want to make sure we might want to reposition that stable mic to between you two. Um, I keep chair keeps maybe sliding. like, yeah, if we put it between, if, okay, let's put it between you two. Like yeah. then, then it'll be like, you'll be looking towards it. You know, here you go. Thomas. I'll put it between these two. You're saying. Um, yeah, so I, I I don't disagree with what you're saying, um, which is that, um, or or you know, if I would translate a little bit more into Marxist Marxism ease, um, I think that what it feels to me you're fighting against is a certain kind of um, idealism, um, which is that uh, that 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 basically, I mean, and I, I actually. You know, in my critique of of um, a lot of Marxist organizations, um, the real question is why is there constant splitting going on um, in a lot of these organizations? And I think it's because they don't have a common material situation, um, which is they're not working on a common project, really. Um, um, they're working on their own uh, individual little project. And so my sort of response to that is to say, okay, well, then what you need is for everyone to be materially bound to each other somehow, um, which means that you have to come up with a common situation that will um, hold this sort of empty space for um, these various tendencies to, to come into contact with each other. And, and some might say that the DSA attempts this, but it does so very badly. Um, and or you know the 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 other name for the DSA um, that I've heard recently in the past is uh, you know the clearinghouse of the left that sort of thing, and of course the problem is that it's not necessarily a space where this left is making any making any kind of theoretical progress, or if it's making a theoretical process progress, it's not happening at the level of like where you can observe it. It's happening somehow underneath, um, and so part of the reason is that even within the DSA, things are organized sometimes to be where you know different tendencies will just end up with different like spaces in which they are completely separate from all the other tendencies. And so what we need is a is a common space for everyone to communicate with each other. So I I think that this is this is exactly where the politics I think differ the most is that I think that people need a a space to politically organize in this unified way, but that we need to actually have political practice that allows us to organize in a pluralistic, uh, non-ideologically specific spaces. Absolutely. And so I think that this idea of trying to take to uh, society, to a popular level of thinking, um, a sort of organization that they could be put inside of even conceptually i think is part of the problem that like we we do need to be able to articulate the um we we need theory to be able to articulate what is the commonality that already does exist and in that way it, it is exactly in that way that 
we mean for the politics to come out of struggle, not for the politics to already be um, uh, to already have a, an articulated uh, struggle that they're they're wanting to start from. And so I think that, um, yeah, the 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 idea that something like the DSA, which what I would describe is you're you're sort of describing something that is itself a grouping of tendencies. Mm -hmm. And because of that, what it could possibly do without being in a situation that's like of struggle and is in only in a, let's call it a political situation or a political level context that what can come out of that is just political struggle, which means splits. I mean, I don't see like any other thing that could be coming from that context than that. Yeah, and, and, and so that's why, that's why I emphasize that you would need to build a workers firm that's actually producing something out in the world. And the reason why you that because but, now you're but, in a situation but where you again, can't like, just split. We can't decide what we need to build without deciding what elements are here for building today. Sure. So we actually need to be able to produce collective analysis from now to even know what ingredients we could put into that thing. Mm -hmm. So even in any way that that's relevant, I think we need to treat it like an incipient idea not a kind of politics, because if it's already a politics, then you're convincing people these elements are here or we need to get these elements here or and it's never starting from what actually just is here. It's not starting from the real things people have access to today and that politics needs to be able well, to begin from where people actually already have immediate. Access. So I would give I would give a few indications in the direction of terms of what people yeah, a few indications in terms of what people have today or what's going on in politics um, that I think are strange sort of um, indications in this direction. Um, and and the first thing is is I think that um, there's a certain sort of anti like not wanting to have a single unified institution, um, which I mean under capitalism it's the state, under feudalism the church, under uh, caste society it's the organized you know caste of uh, people who actually uh, rule. Um, what I'm wondering, though, and, and this is may, might be like the, the maybe the deepest level of, of 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 disagreement, is that I think that even in the future, when we're dealing with you know a communist society or with a society where there's sort of an explosion of different people going out into space, um, that you know that Dave was talking about, um, that that society will will have a unified point of uh, institutional unity, which is managing production. Um, and the reason that you still like, you still have to get, you know, products from various places to other various places. You still have to um, deliver goods to people. Um, they have to be, they still have to be well-made. Like there's room of course, for people's various sort of, um, you know, uh, projects in production, like where they want to make art or that sort of thing. But, you know, if you're going in for surgery, you don't want it to just be up to like whatever random thing's going to happen. You either need to have a skilled surgeon there or you need to have um, a machine that will do it automatically. And if you have a machine that's a complicated, you know, technical process um, where there's lots of contradictions involved, they all have to be sort of accounted for and that sort of thing. And um, I, I think I think you're maybe arguing with like a kind of anarchist that's not here. And okay. I think that like uh, when you're talking about like um some disagreement on long-term objectives. What I'm what I'm saying is that I'm calling those long-term objectives ideology because they need to stay fixed and they need to actually not be these uh, things at play. And that's why we need to decouple ideology and theory. That's why the anarchist uh, tradition does not uh, group those things together because it's seen as a problem that is inherent to Marxism that these things are not seen as uh, like like. I I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying, but I don't see like it doesn't get away from like, OK, so then how do we articulate a politics? OK, so where are we right now? And and like I, I think that all of that discussion that you're 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 offering there is entirely on an ideological level, which that's fine. I, I'm not I, I don't think we're in some place to be producing valid like uh, ideology with each other. But I think that like um uh, as far as political practice goes, that's exactly what we do need to be trying to figure out how to do together. And that uh, that would include being able to recognize like, okay, you have this maybe objective and this other person has this objective. 
what unity does exist, what what commonality does exist. And it's why I go back to the conjuncture mm -hmm. and that that is the commonality that does exist. So a couple of things that I think we should all talk about is how we're understanding these words. You've said it's you know dialectical, but you've also, you said something in your article that was published in Sublation Meg this year. Um, something that I thought was really interesting is basically you said that theory, uh, the institution of theory has traditionally been the church. And so you are... are uh, without you didn't elaborate on it a whole lot. I mean, it, it, you do a little bit, but I. It's one of those things where it's like that's really fascinating to me. You said some things in that article that I'm like, I would love to see you write whole other articles just based on little things that you say in there. And that one in particular, I'm very interested in how you think of theory, um, because it does seem like theory and ideology for you are just the same thing. Um, and so I want to give you a chance to talk about that, but I also want to give Anna a chance here to. To weigh in a little bit, we'll probably go for another 15 minutes. I definitely want to give you both a chance uh, to ask questions if you've got questions, as well as people in the live chat. And the goal is that this leaves us wanting to talk more than we are able to, because we are still alive. And for at least another few years, we'll hopefully get to continue living. And as long as we're living, then we can hopefully continue the conversation. But let's hand it to Anne here for a minute. Oh. Thank you. Um, I, it's it's more just a question for you to kind of along the lines of what you were just asking, but I'm curious, and I bet people in our audience are curious too, Carl, like what anarchism means in the way that you are doing it. And then same question to you, Thomas, what socialism means and what being a socialist means to you and the organizations that you were involved with. So maybe you can address both of those questions here. <laughs> so you want to go first? Uh, yeah. So I would I would say that um, what what anarchism is is a method, and that in that way it is a it, it's it's a way of getting to an objective. It's a way of collectively arriving at an objective. Um, we we could, uh, and I think yeah. In in a lot of ways, um, I think with most of the the revolutionary uh, socialist movement, I don't think that we're disagreeing about the final objectives we're aiming at. I think that what we're disagreeing with is about the methods. And so when I'm talking about anarchism in a context of today, um, I am definitely meaning to uh, articulate it as something that has grown out of a tradition of these things that didn't just come from someone inventing it or coming up with it. Um, and and in that, that way, like it's it's something that needs to be um, learned from people in the past, uh, learned from other people with experience. That also means learning from people in contexts that we think are important to engage ourselves with. That um, that politics needs to not just be uh, yeah developed from outside. So I think in a lot of ways, it's a kind of political practice of. Um, uh, situated context for people's struggle. Um, my my personal engagement with this has to do with um, with militancy. And so I am uh, progressing, especially in the English language, um, these articulations of anarchism, which is, uh, yeah, been been um, largely repressed, uh, not not present a lot in the United States or in the Anglophone sphere. Um, so uh, in addition to that, yeah, like uh, I think uh, around like uh, militant education, it's very important that people know what they're engaging in, that a lot of times, and this happened to me as well, um, you actually end up doing militancy without realizing what you're doing. And you've taken yourself, you've taken on stuff that you can't, um, you can't be, be in charge of. And yeah. You've done it for me before, but militancy well, so um, I think in, a, in an important way, militancy is is taking up an ideology and choosing to promote those ideas in spaces. And so I think that in the U.S., we have really been tricked into thinking that that word doesn't matter and that that action is not part of uh, 
of revolutionary struggle. And so militancy has a lot to do with kind of, um, if we use an analogy or a metaphor, like to make, put a stake in the ground and defend where that stake is and not just let it disappear. And so it has to do with a kind of combativity, but a combativity that is meaning to be like, um, progressing the struggle, not progressing. Uh, I mean, I'm not here to progress my name, to progress my own writings. I have no reason to be putting my own intellectual effort into anything other than the movement itself. And that does mean on the political level, but also on the social level. So uh, in this way of like trying to, I think y'all, y'all use a phrase like the uh, life of the mind. And I think that it's worth thinking about what does the life of the mind look like if it's entirely developed out of situation, out of context, and not kind of playing a sort of escapism and inventing a place to think from that's that's outside of here? So yeah, I think that anarchism is a, a political practice, but it, it's inherently about like context. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for socialism, um, which is not a completely opposed category to anarchism, um, not completely overlapping either. Um, I, so it's, it, it's a difficult remit because, um, socialism is both the historical movement of socialism, like, um, by which I mean, it's, you know, it's what actually happened. Um, so that includes, you know, both the good things and the bad things, um, and it's also uh, all of so it's all of that baggage, but it's also the the sort of hope to overcome that baggage, I guess. Um, and and uh, specifically, I would say that socialism is all the baggage of the movement for freedom and the hope to overcome the baggage of the movement for freedom. That would be my sort of feeling of what socialism is. Um, and uh, that means that it includes the bourgeois movements of capitalism um within it uh necessarily um you know i i i saw this uh talk recently where ben, ben burgess was arguing with somebody about you know equality versus freedom and um that marx emphasizes freedom and it's and i, I agree with that but of course the the other thing to, to point out is that the idea of equality it's not a socialist ideal equality is a bourgeois ideal that's the ideal of capitalism um, and socialism is about recognizing the necessary um, components of that ideal, but then also trying to figure out how to have freedom even even when we have equality. So, um, so to me, that that that's kind of um, what that is. Uh, and, and I do, and actually, just just to um, sort of defend my position a bit. Um, I do recognize the difference between theory and ideology. I just didn't understand that that was the conversation that we were having was ideology and theory as such. But um, yeah, so uh, do we, does anyone else have a question? Maybe the maybe the audience. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so. I am um, part of the electricians union, and so I align more with a praxis uh, standpoint, I personally, um, because I don't think that the everyday person could necessarily have the time and energy to get through various theories and then decide which one is best for them. Um, and also, when everyone reads a theory, um, they take something different away. They read it differently. The the image in their head, the model of the world in their head is different. And I do think it's only when people come together and talk about and make a concrete decision on a specific thing uh, that that theory is brought into life. And that that done a bunch of different times over different certain incidences um, creates the world that we live in, like uh, capitalism. You've got theorists that write on that. However, our world is not any one of those. Um, uh, the, you no know, human civilization like can come about, in, in my belief, from a plan. 
just because we don't work that way, plans always get go awry. Um, I do though think there's value in it because there's got to be like that kernel, um, that common kernel. So like today, everyone's got that capitalism. Everyone knows what money is. Everyone knows it's a very like personal thing to them. And um, everyone knows when they get slighted by another person monetarily. Um, they've got that internal, I am my own business. I've got my own bank account. And uh, more has got to come in than goes out. That's not, I mean, they are good, but it exists fundamentally, physically, and everything's fine. And I think if, I don't know how, but if we could like have some sort of cultural change to where some of these elements of these theories can, for me, it's worth it out. It's um, showing up to union meetings, knowing that my dues that I pay, they don't go to the contract and be able to want what to do with them. And uh, each one of us has the most power, um, the same power. Uh, we elect our own officials and stuff. We decide on what they get paid. I don't know. It wasn't really a question. I was just, I've been wanting to say my piece. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, in my vision of like a practical reality going forward would be like, the electricians union right we have our contractors what if we had so we have six million in our general fund right now what if we bought a bunch of tools vans and started competing against the contractors ourselves bid the work ourselves and then when we made money we could vote on what to do with that money that's in my mind the practical like future i see is like different industries having their workers organized and they run their own businesses, but no one owns the business. It's a collective business, every single industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. And Nicole. Yeah. Um, it sounds like something that could probably get swallowed up by your single firm, eh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they could work with the firm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're basically at a time where we got to start wrapping up here. I want to give everybody uh, an opportunity to close this down. Um, and, and you can kind of raise more questions that you wish we could have gotten to or things you wish that you could have elaborated on. Kind of just like flirt with the future, right? Because we we do have time to, to come back to these things. And so um, uh, I will just hand it off here to, to Nance, uh, in a second, but I guess I'll just say there's no such thing as a non-instrumentalized space. Everything in our lives is instrumentalized. Right. And so that, that means that everything has ends, everything has goals. And, um, the overwhelming majority of our time on this earth has been spent or gobbled up by capital. Right. And so uh, being able to find ourselves in a space where we're able to get a reprieve from that doesn't just happen from going out onto the grass and being like, aha, I'm outside of capital now, right? It does, you can't just get outside of it. And so um, and that's because we still have to, we still have to make things work for ourselves. We have to have a roof over our heads and food on the table and things like that. And so you know, we get this little reprieve out in the woods or whatever, and then we're right back to it. And so that, that reprieve is in reference to it. So even that reprieve, that time away is instrumentalized because really you're just doing that so that you can get a breather from the very instrumentalized thing that you're trying to get away from. And so um, I'm, I'm saying this more as a self-critique because I'm kind of saying that we need a sort of non-instrumentalized space for theory, but that's impossible. And so what we really need, I'm saying, is like a space for people to refine their tools. Um, and some people are going to have different ends in mind. But I do think that there's a value in going through a period of suspending those ends themselves if you have burnt out on, say, the thing that you were in militant struggle uh, advocating for, right? And so if what you're doing is working, though, then you shouldn't stop, right? And there will always be both theory and practice, but um, it's a 
point of degree and emphasis. Take care, Carl. Thank you so much. Oh my God. Goodbye. Nice. Um, Um, and speaking of, of Carl now behind his back in his absence, cause he just had to run out the door. Uh, he's got to go do things. Um, I often like say anarchist as a sort of like pejorative term. It's like my experiences with anarchists are not overwhelmingly positive. Um, I, there's a procedural fetishism or I don't even like the word fetishism in this case because maybe that it, it, we think of the Marxist way of using that word and we can go off into these weeds. But I'm like a procedural, a hard on for procedure itself. I'll just say a hard on for procedure itself. Um, and that Occupy was very much that, right? It was very culty, like people like, let's reinvent how we communicate and let's all experiment with it. But none of this actually had anything to do with changing people's material conditions. And uh, and doing anything to stop capital from killing us all and leaving the planet, and so, um, with that said, though, it is real human beings like Carl who keep me down to earth from just going all in on well, our anarchism is all bullshit anyway. No, there's I, there's really important stuff being done by anarchists, and I think that. There are Christians in my life where they put their money where their mouth is. They actually do help other people. And it's not just evangelizing. It's not all instantly like preaching in your face. It's like, no, they actually are just out there helping people and 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 being open-minded. And, and maybe they'll witness to you like in the sense of like hearing you out, not blah, blah, blah. Here's what I think. Here's what I think. And those are the Christians I respect in the same way that there are anarchists who are like this and I respect them. And I think that Carl is one of those anarchists. And so I really do appreciate the fact that he does what he does with really it's, a, I don't know the full extent of all of the work that he does, but one of the things that he's actively doing is fighting monolingualism, right? Fighting monolingualism. is like a very serious thing to be doing in the United States, right? The heart of empire and the one place where everybody would prefer to forget that everyone else in the world is like bi or trilingual, right? Um, and that that comes with tremendous um, ignorance, right? So we're all a bunch of idiots, assuming that assuming that we're all monolinguals. Um, I'm working on it. We're combating it every day, and uh, Anne and I have been tutoring with Carl um, for a long time now. I mean, pretty much this year. And I don't know, I just really respect that work and and the, the stuff we do with multilingualism events at Boise State on a weekly basis. Um, is Theory Underground. What did I say? <laughs> Boise State. Did I say Boise State? <laughs> yeah. That's a weird slip. <laughs> we haven't even been in Boise the whole time that we've been do- doing this. Yeah. We're about to go back to Boise though, and Anne's going back to Boise State. So anyway, slip. But yeah, no, at Theory Underground, we do these weekly hub events and... Uh, I'm really excited to do them as soon as we get back to Boise. Anyway, um, we owe that to him and to his direct action. And that, I don't know, I think there's something special uh, to being a human and keeping our possible futures open in direct action and mutual aid. And so I do appreciate that, but also the proceduralism thing and thinking that just getting rid of Robert's rules of order and and rolling in some new finger snapping, no clapping, sparkly hands, whatever thing that you cooked up with some other people you met at a place and then called it the situation misses the fact that the situation is that you being there with those people is on the backs of the other seven point whatever billion people who are not present. Right. And so every time we get together with other people and then we start trying to figure out what we want to do in our little local groups, we're presupposing the overwhelming mass majority of people who can't be there. And I think that's where the Marxist structural tendency comes in is to say, who fucking cares about our little folk politics? What about the world? And with that said though, I think that he's right to be bitch slapping us right across the face (laughs) saying (laughs) no, you guys keep making recourse to like this sort of like nowhere land. And I think that there is a danger in, in trying to do universal things where we end up doing this like 
this th- sort of theoretical a space that's non-instrumentalized when it, when of course it always is and it's always the background conditions of it its conditions of possibility are everybody else who can't be there working so um thank you to everybody else who's there, who's there working making this possible yeah. Yeah. i uh i i love conversations like this um uh, when i was a kid i when i was a kid, when i was younger um uh, um i was like full bore into anarchism and then as i got older and had kids and um faced reality i leaned into marxism um and now I don't know where I land and it doesn't matter. Um, but I, I, I do love seeing the two parts of me um, have a struggle session. I think currently um, <clears throat> I'm skeptical of, of worker movements because the mode of production is, has totally changed. Like it, it no longer is base. I, I believe it is super structure. I, I believe um a broad workers movement, not only is it impossible, but it, it would be ineffective were it possible. And I'm looking forward to having more conversation with you about it because I do think um, your paper in sublation was really interesting. There's actually a few points that we both were like, oh man, this is great. This is super interesting. Um, so I'm definitely hoping for an extended dialogue over the coming future. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you all. Thank you guys for coming and giving us your attention and and your presence and all that. Thank you, internet. And thank you. And thank Carl, of course. Um, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for the thank yous. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so in, in, uh, in Carl's defense, um, cause uh, we were having this sort of, I, I, I think that his, his point is that if we're going to be talking about theory, there's a, there's a deconstructive aspect of theory, especially if he's coming at this as like, you know, I'm also analyst guy. Um, and so you're going to throw your fantasy at me and now I'm going to uh, resist it no matter what, because that's the whole process. You know, you, the fantasy comes into contact with reality of another subject who breaks it down. Um, so in that sense, I think um, what he's doing is useful. However, I also was hoping to talk more about my thing. So, <laughs> yeah. So, OK, um, which um, so that that makes me into the asshole here. And I guess I guess my my first disagreement would just be that also it's also these you know these things structurally build on top of each other. So it is it is the case that theory is not identical with ideology, but theory is also based on ideology. Um, by which I mean that uh, ideology is an aspect of theory, or it's a it's a hyper specific form of theory, or or you might even flip it around the reverse way and say that um, all theories have this sort of ideological. Um, basis that they stand on, and it's only when they're able to come into self-critique um, that I think that they become theory. Then, um, but uh, and so uh, everything you're saying about the situation, and I, I don't even uh, disagree with it very much. Um, you know, I think that you know if we had a chance to talk about sort of towards the end of my paper, part of the part of the idea that I put forward is that you do need to have these, um, you do need to have a space um in which you have resources provided for your political enemies and that's something that capitalism solves by just having corporations right like one group of capitalists disagrees with a different group of capitalists well that's they own their thing we own our thing we're able to put whatever we want on our thing and they can put whatever whatever they want on their thing and now we're we have freedom of association you know everybody's happy except of course this capitalism um and we have to be able to provide resources like we have to we have to be able to have a society where you know even alex jones gets some sort of stupid stipend to stand on his channel and yell and rant about stupid bullshit like that's and and so that has to be an aspect of what is going on is the ability to have a difference of opinion and to say no this is about a difference of opinion so we're going to talk about our opinion over here for a bit and then when it comes to the collective project we're going to bring that opinion that we've developed to everyone else. Sure. But it's, you know, it's our opinion. It's not, not the same as everybody else's. So um, the one thing that did come up that, or that didn't come up that I thought I was going to bring up at some point was um, specifically about this sort of firm idea or having a single firm is there is a kind of ridiculous shape of this that exists out in politics right now, which is the idea of a uh, meme stock. So if you think of these sort of like stupid, you know, GameStop, 
um, Bed Bath and Beyond, um, sort of this this it's kind of a silly and dumb idea. Um, however, it seems to me that what's going on there is people are trying to treat GameStop like a worker, like the the Universal Workers Firm, like these sort of these sort of um, uh, libertarian, you know, ish sort of people. Like they 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 have this idea that you know we need to collectively do something together in the realm of economics. Um, and they're trying to, in a very stupid way, I, you know, um, I don't, I shouldn't use that word maybe, but you know, in, in that, what's that? Yeah. Certainly with no direction <laughs> and a fun, direction. funny in a very funny way. <laughs> they, you know, they, 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 they do, they collect a bunch of economic power into one place and, you know, cause a giant fluctuation in the market. Um, and if the working class was able to do that, except, you know, not with GameStop, because what the fuck, but with like an actual workers firm, then, then things I think would be much more interesting what's going on. But so, you know, th these kinds of reflections, they get thrown up in capitalism and, and it's almost like, you know, Mark said, you know, Hegel says history repeats itself, but he forgot to say first is tragedy, second is farce. Well, now we're just, we're kind of in the stage where everything's farce, you know, like yeah. capitalism is just repeating farce over and over again. So anyway. Thank you. I can go with this microphone um, and I'll just repeat another thank you to our in-person audience, to you, Thomas, and to Carl, who hopefully hears us in the future, um, the internet audience. Um, this, I think, is all... It's important conversation. And then like that, that nihilistic part in me, currently the political nihilist just goes, why are we just talking about it? Like, like there's so much talking about it, but I still think it's important. And kind of where I'm at right now is like, keep working with your union. Like that's so awesome that you guys have that dynamic. Like I'm sure your DSA, I can't wait to hear more about like what you do with the DSA. And we have other DSA friends who's like, I want to know, like, okay, what, what what do you see? What's what is the DSA doing? Because I think that local individual action right now, with everything being broken and divided into 8 billion different fragments of ideas is like, we just got to work with that right now to make our own lives better and to make the lives of people around us and in our unions and our local organizations and communities better and keep, you know, reading and learning and trying to understand. And maybe one day it'll all come together in this amazing thing. Or maybe, you know, we'll all run out of fossil fuels and the internet will stop and we'll all have to, like, pretend like it's 1300s again. Like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think we all just have, like, we can't give up. Like, even though I'm nihilistic and I go, oh, what, why, does any of this, why does any of this matter? It's like, we can't give up. And the people who find hope in their various organizations and the anarchism that Carl is doing, it's like, yeah, that's important. Keep doing it. And so that's the message I guess I want to leave us off on here is like, don't lose hope, but not in like a cliche way and like, no, for real, like keep doing what you're doing. It is not hopeless. You can make your own lives and the lives of people around you better. So thank you. Yay. <laughs> Like, comment, subscribe. Bye. <laughs> no, but for real, if you made it this far, do let us know. Say something in the comments after the fact. Um, remember, the conversation doesn't stop. Download the app. It's on the Android and Apple stores. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, bye.